an all-new Dr. Phil. More all-new surprising updates. With a guest that you can't stop talking about. The tipsy preschool teacher. On my break, I'd get a pint of vodka. As you sit here today, are you sober? And the alleged soccer mom, madam. I've never owned an escort service. Her ex's shocking admission. I would like to set the record straight with regards to my ex-wife's business. Every day we get emails from viewers asking whatever happened to so-and-so. Where are they now? So today we're following up with some of my most memorable guests to find out what happened after the show. From a soccer mom accused of running a high-end brothel to an out-of-control drunk who bragged about getting away with drinking at preschool, we received some surprising updates on some of our most talked about episodes. Viewers flooded our message boards when we aired the show about Linda, whose husband and daughters all said they hated her because of her drunken antics. But her husband was no help. He was leaving sandwiches and beers at their bedroom door just to keep Linda happy. My mom's an alcoholic, and it's really gotten out of hand. My mom drinks every day, all day. I'm not sure that I can even have a relationship with her anymore. I feel disgusted by my mother. My mom chased after me and threatened to burn my face on the stove. My mom likes to lock herself in the bathroom to drink. There's a sports drink bottle here, which is not the right color or flavor, so I know she's obviously put something in here. You think it's never going to get better? I don't think she'll ever get better. I hate my mother. You resent this woman. Yes. My wife is not a role model to my daughters at all. She's more like their roommate that'll occasionally make them something to eat. Drinking my, drinking my little drink and making it. I feel more like her caretaker than her husband. Thank you, idiot. Well, Linda's here. And she says, and I quote, beer is more important than my daughters. I can easily drink nine 24 ounce beers. That would be like drinking 18 beers for a regular human being. There are times when I do choose beer over them. I've never abused them, and I have not put them in harm's way. Are you drunk now? No, I'm not drunk. I'm not drunk now, no, but yes, I did. I drank today. I, I did. You've called this precious child a whore and a slut. Have I said that to her? Yes, Mom. You've called her a skeleton and made comments about her being a hunchback because she has scoliosis. That's more because of her posture. Are you me, Dad? Because you know my question for you is, you said this has been going on for 10 years. What the hell are you thinking? You know she's an alcoholic, right? Yes. Did she wake up a few days ago and you had left her a sandwich and a beer? Yes. You have no idea how much I want to slap out of you. I right? thought you were this situation needs a hero, and I nominate you. <laughs> Linda and Scott were literally parenting while intoxicated. Have things changed? We sat down with both this summer to find out. Take a look. Well, it's great to see you two. It was a little different last time. Yes, it was. It seems like uh, things are much different in your lives now. How has the journey been? Me personally, it's been interesting, and I have to say that just stopping uh -huh. wasn't that hard. I would agree. I think that achieving sobriety was the easy part. If you think about it this way, like our house was on fire, now the house is put out, yeah. but now we got to rebuild it. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Drinking my drinking my little drink and making eggs. Were you surprised to have the insight? you did about where you were in all of this? Oh, yes. To be honest with you, I thought I was gonna come on the show and you were gonna go, oh, that's too bad for you, Scott. You're, you're doing a great job, you know, doing what you can. And it was the exact opposite and it was exactly what I needed to hear. Cause you know, my question for you is, you said this has been going on for 10 years. What the hell are you thinking? When you're in the middle of it, it's so hard to see what somebody that comes in with a fresh perspective can see. And the thing about the two of you is once you saw it on the screen, once you heard your daughters say it out loud, it was like, I get it. And frankly, you ran t towards the help. I wanted out. I wanted to be done with this. I couldn't stand myself. I couldn't stand my life. I couldn't stand what was going on. I 
knew I was hurting my children, but I couldn't stop it. It was, it was, it was more not knowing what to do, where to yeah. go, how to, how to stop it, I guess. And it was, it was horrible. Was there anything they said that stuck out to you? I think there was something that he said in one of the little things. She's more like a burden than a partner. It almost would be a relief if she did pass away. I knew how bad it was, but I didn't realize that he was hating me that much. I, I didn't hate you. I had so little faith in myself and so little faith in her. I didn't know what else would make it end. Your daughters were so forthcoming, which gave us so much insight and so much to work with. And I, I was really committed. You're gonna now rediscover each other and you're gonna start building your relationship back. And you need to be really patient about that. That's truly where we are. That's it's, exactly it's, where we, we are a, right now. You know, the, you know, we're not drinking, but guess what? I, we don't know what to do with each other. When you do look back and realize what was going on, what's the most shocking thing to you? Probably one of the most shocking things to me was that I didn't know how badly Autumn was feeling about herself. That was a real a wake up when I realized it, when she said she thought that I hated her. Because this was a big thing for Autumn. What a gift you've yeah. given to her now. She gave me an awesome Mother's Day gift yesterday. Yeah. I'll yeah. cry. She, she, she just wrote me a thing on Facebook that said, I'm proud to call you my mom and that you're my mom. You're there for me and I love you and I'm so proud of you. And I never thought I would hear those words again. I really did not think I was going to be able to come back. What did that mean to you when you read that? It meant that what I have done and what I'm striving to do is worth it, definitely. And to keep, keep doing it and better the relationships with all of them. You guys have been great and there are millions of people watch this and go, I need to hear what he said to them. You get the benefit of the up close and personal, we get a teaching tool. So it's a great, that's, it's a great transaction. Yeah. That's, that's why we, I was really, behind, I really wanted us to come and do this. It's worth getting help. It's worth doing something, you know, it, it does get better. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yes. That's great. I have my daughters back. That's. Yeah. All right, yeah. guys. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Phil. It's Riley and Autumn. Since we've been on the show, our family's taken almost like a 180 degree turn and things are so much better than they were. We can actually have a relationship with our mother. Our parents don't fight anymore. The entire home environment is so much more positive. It's overwhelming how many changes we've been through. We're all doing so much better. Before the show, I didn't think it was possible to get our family back, to have a normal life, to have a good, healthy life. It's almost like a dream how much better it is. And the show and you just turned everything around and gave us a new chance, a new lease on life. And I'm really thankful for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Phil. Next, it was an emotional father-son reunion when Butch confronted his father for the first time in 33 years, demanding to know why he killed his mother. Clarice was drunk. And it was extremely hard for me to listen to you insult my mother that way. Following up with some of my most memorable guests. Someone who touched our hearts when he appeared on the show was Butch. At just 12 years old, he was caught up in a nightmare, forced to listen to his mother, Clarice, being shot and killed by his own father. 33 years later, Butch came to me desperate for answers and wanting me to help him confront his ailing father, Ulysses. For the first time in 33 years, Butch spoke to Ulysses about that fateful night. On the morning of June 25th, 1978, my mother come into the house and I heard her tell my father that she was leaving. My father said, if you try to leave, I'll kill you. My mother yelled out, kill me, kill me. Then I heard two gunshots. My mother was shot twice in her head. I walked over to her and she had this huge, huge hole in, in the right side of her. I have not been able to forgive my father. My father killed my mother. Last night, Butch's father, Ulysses, was admitted to the hospital for heart conditions. He's joining us on the phone from his hospital bed. You say you take accountability for this. 
but you say this was an accident. I came home one night, my wife, she had been drinking. She went back, she got the gun, and I want to get in control of it. I shot her. I cannot believe this was happening. My intention was never to hurt my wife, scare her, yes, but never to take her life. As a result of my wife losing her life, my son Butch has literally shed me out of his life. What's your reaction, Butch, to hearing what your father said? Well, Dr. Phil, I've, I've heard it so much before that in many ways, I actually wasn't even listening. You know, it, it's the same convoluted tale of lies. I will not forgive lies. I just won't do it. Ulysses, is there anything that you want to say to your son, Butch? If my son wants me to hear me say, I shot your mother twice, I'll say it because I did. Yes, I took her life. The night of that incident, Clarice was drunk. And it is story, extremely hard for I mean, me to listen to you insult out. my mother that way. Do you hear me? Phil. The police report specified that both you and she showed no signs of being drunk. The only thing I can do in order to end this is tell my son, I am very sorry for what occurred. He was in another room. He didn't see what happened. He came out the room when she was laying down. He did not see what was going on. Was this an accident or was it a, a fit of rage? Caught rage and emotions caught up on both parts. So it was not an accident? If that's what you want to say. No, I'm not. But the I'm... point is that was not meant to happen. Butch struggled keeping his emotions in check. He believed Ulysses was blaming his mother for what happened that night. But was that the last time Butch ever spoke with his dad? Well, take a look. Hey, Butch. Hello, Dr. Phil. Well, it's good to see you. You said while you were here that there was something I said that resonated with you that was a light bulb moment for you. It was that moment, Dr. Phil, where you said that this moment needs a hero. It was then where I, I realized that I, I could actually do something, that I could take that opportunity to forgive my father and to get us on an entirely different course. It was, it was like you calling to me and saying, you can do this. And I, that was it for me. Tell me why that resonated with you. I did not want my legacy, my mother's memory, my relationship with my father to be a tragedy. I just, I couldn't live with it. You were 12 when your mother was shot. And, That's correct. And I, I realized that you had spent all of those years without a father to guide you. Taking that opportunity to be that hero, taking that opportunity to embrace my father under what some would view as one of the worst situations a person could experience, I figured out I would rewrite the history at the same time I was rewriting the future. I did not want to fail. I spent a lot of time in my life thinking about being a failure. I spent a lot of time thinking about losing my mother. And I did not want to be a failure. I wanted to rise to the challenge. And when you left the show, you had not been talking to your father. You hadn't seen him. I came back in contact with my father just 18 months before he passed away. I was able to get my father to get on the plane and come visit his grandchildren for the first and only time. I was able to change my heart. and We, we just had so many plans, Dr. Phil. I owe a lot to you and, and your willingness to help us out. Well, listen, it's my honor to do it. And I understand that you and your father actually visited your mother's grave together. I had no idea that he had never been there in the 33 years since she passed away. It was an overwhelming moment. I get a sense that when your father did pass that you had a sense of peace when he did. I absolutely did. And so I had an opportunity to shake off a lot of hatred and anger and I, I feel so full as a man. I just can't imagine where I'd be right now if that hadn't happened. I can tell you that your story, your courage, and you embracing the power of forgiveness has touched millions of people through this show and through your being here now to catch us up with it. And I just want to thank you for having the courage to do that. I thank you so much for having the courage to do that. And again, thank you. The name Dr. Phil will always have a special place in my heart. As will Butch in mind. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Butch. When Jessie's drunk, she becomes belligerent. Tell Dr. Phil what I am. A piece of I'm 
so pissed at you right now. I'm not like your parents. I'm not guilt motivated. I don't give a Today, we're turning back the clock to give you updates on some of our most memorable guests. You'll remember Jesse. She not only had a dangerous eating disorder that forced her parents to lock up their food in cages, she was also an out of control drunk who bragged about getting away with drinking at preschool. She worked there. Take a look. My daughter Jessie is an alcoholic. You're wasted. She has sucked the life out of all of us. I will never speak to you because you're psychotic. When Jessie's drunk, she becomes belligerent. Tell Dr. Phil what I am. A piece of I just want to know why you drank. Get away from me before I freak out. I think she's dying. I feel like we have maybe a couple months with her. Just one hour before Jessie was about to sit down and be interviewed for this show, she drank this, an entire bottle of vodka. I drink a gallon of vodka a day. You're such an alcoholic. Go! Go away. These are the woods behind my house, and I like to hide a lot of my liquor bottles in here. I have driven drunk numerous times. I drove with my son. I was drunk the whole time. Didn't even think about it. I used to work at a preschool, and on my break, I would get a pint of vodka, and I would drink half of it. I never got caught. So you were working at the preschool? Yes. Drunk around these kids? I was never drunk, but I was buzzed. You, you steal money from your parents? Yes. You lost custody of your son? Correct. You, you've driven drunk with your son? You ain't got far to run, girl. My husband has full custody of my son. Seven to 10 days a month, I get to see my son. I want to party too much, but I'm not in the right state of mind to be a full-time mom. Why did you walk off? Because I'm so pissed at you right now. Yeah, you told my I producer can't... backstage him, he's not taking my son away from me, right? Right. Yeah, you, know, you don't know what I'm gonna do. Yeah, I do. I'm not like your parents. I'm not guilt motivated. I don't give a whether you like me or whether you don't. So, the plot thickens. There's more to it. I'm a bulimic. Every day, I will find puke in the toilet. I clean it three times a day. This is our refrigerator. We have to have locked cages. In my dining room, I have a huge Tupperware container that is locked with all the peanut butter, breads, dry foods. They can't stop me. I always can figure out the code, I get a thrill out of it. Your life's not working. It's not working mentally, emotionally, psychologically, or physically. Not at all. How about we clean you up for real, and then we go back to court, get that little boy, and put him in your lap where he belongs? What do you think about that? I want you to have what you deserve. What do you think about that? I think that sounds amazing. So how's Jessie doing now? Is the food still in cages? Was she able to put down the bottle and become a better mom? Well, take a look. Everything's just so great. I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to go get treatment and have my life saved. I mean, it's a true blessing. So let's go back to when you were first coming to the show. Obviously, you did not want to come, right? I did not want to. I knew if I wanted to live even at all, even a halfway happy life, I knew I, I had no choice. You said I was the first person to ever call on you. Absolutely. I was very mad at you. I think, you know, the reason I was so mad at you is because deep down I knew it was true. Everything you were saying, it was totally 100% accurate. I had to come to terms with that was my life. At the time, I thought I had control over my life. Just by you, um, standing up to me and kind of shoving in my face the reality of my situation. It's like, oh my gosh, this is my life. As you sit here today, are you sober? I am sober, absolutely. And how long have you been sober? A little over two years. How about your eating disorder? Is it better, worse, the same? It is better. We now have a normal fridge today and we're living a normal life. It's a total blessing. 
I know how to cope. I know what I need to do to make better decisions, and I do. At the time, you were only able to see your son supervised, very limited, very difficult, sometimes drinking during those visits. But today, I understand that you have 50-50 custody of your son and that you are the residential parent. He lives with me during the school year, and you know I can get him to bed and help him with his homework. It's been amazing. It's been great. And I understand that you have a little one. I do. She is almost four months old now. Her name is Penny. She's a cute little thing. <laughs> and you're going to school, right? I want to be a counselor, so I'm going to go on and get my master's. I really want to work with addicts and alcoholics who are seeking recovery, um, who want to feel that, that hope you know, that I have found, that freedom that I have found. I am proud of your progress. Thanks a lot. So long. Bye. Next, she was a married soccer mom accused of running a high-end brothel that catered to elite and high-profile clients. You're still denying that you were running a prostitution ring. No, I've never owned an escort service. You are denying it because I asked you, were you arranging sex for money? And you said no. It's so you were either lying then or you're lying then. Hey, I'm following up with guests that you can't stop talking about. One of those is Anna Gristina, the soccer mom arrested for running a multi-million dollar prostitution ring. Anna was on house arrest at the time of my first interview with her, so we traveled to her home in upstate New York because she insisted she wanted to tell the truth behind the accusations. But we got anything but the truth. Tonight, a 44-year-old mother is busted, accused of running a brothel on the Upper East Side. Scandal strikes suburbia. Anna Christina allegedly made as much as 10 million bucks from a prostitution ring over the last 15 years. After spending about four months in jail, Christina was released from Rikers Island Tuesday evening after finally reaching a deal over her bail package. What we know now is you were investigated for five years saying that you're running a $15 million call girl ring. I have a matchmaking company that I had just started. There's nothing improper or illegal about it. They say that you have an apartment on the Upper East Side on 78th Street and that during this five years, this apartment was used sometimes with underage girls to have sexual encounters there with powerful men in Manhattan. What do you say about Dr. Felt, let me address that. That, that is true. categorically untrue. We've not seen a shred of evidence to well, that. She can say that. I don't want you asking my client about sex with underage children. We can shut it down right now. I don't care. It's a standard procedure to vilify you in the public. They just picked me off the street, threw me in Rikers, called me a pedophile, almost got me killed, and have ruined my life. Behind every headline, is a family enduring the consequences of the media spotlight. Now, for the first time, Anna's husband, Kelvin, will speak about their marriage. Do you think she is innocent? I think she's innocent, first of all. And I also think, aside from that, there's some type of uh, political agenda behind everything. I think it's about maybe the people that she knew who were, were her uh, personal friends. Uh -huh. And um, I think they're using her as a tool. Just three weeks after my visit, a kernel of truth was revealed. Today, the so-called Upper East Side Madam stunned everyone by pleading guilty. Anna Christina walked out of court a convicted criminal admitting her guilt in the brothel bust. Anna Christina walked free, sentenced to time already served. Even though we knew she was lying to me, we wanted to give Anna one more shot at setting the record straight after she stunned the court by pleading guilty to one count of promoting prostitution but we got more of the same. I promoted prostitution in the eyes of the law, and I took the, the deal for other reasons, to keep other people out of the trial. The last time we were at your home, everything you said to me then at that table in your home, eye to eye, was complete lie. A good part of it was. You're still denying that you were running a prostitution ring. Is that right? I'm just asking. No, I facilitated this older man meeting with somebody compatible and they had ongoing relationships. But I've never owned an escort service or a bordello. You are denying it because I asked you, were you arranging sex for money? And you said no. It's so you were either lying then or you're lying now. 
No, there's an in-between which you're not hearing. You're insulting my intelligence. I am not insulting yes, your intelligence. Yes, you are. I don't feel that I'm lying. You want a black and a white answer. That's what's I true. lived, it just never felt criminal when I did it. It felt like it was doing something nice. It's been four years since speaking to Anna, but she's still making headlines. Most recently, she claimed she supplied Charlie Sheen with women before his HIV diagnosis and that he offered them big bucks not to use protection. Now, although Anna never shied away from the spotlight, her husband has now said, enough is enough. I'm happy to report that I'm at a completely uh, different stage in my life. Uh, I am divorced and working really hard to deal with the uh, wreckage of my past. The relationship with my ex-wife was extremely unhealthy uh, right from the very beginning. It was just very toxic and took me a very, very long time to get out. I carry a tremendous amount of uh, uh, guilt uh, for not leaving earlier. I would really like to take this opportunity to sincerely apologize uh, to you for being dishonest with regards to my ex-wife's business and uh, supporting her facade and lies on your show. I think she's innocent, first of all. I, I think it's about maybe the people that she knew who were, were her uh, personal friends. And um, I think they're using her as a tool for whatever reason. I'm also very happy to report that I'm engaged to a beautiful woman. She is a school teacher, believe it or not. Thanks, Dr. Phil, for the opportunity to set the record straight and to share my journey. Wow, Kelvin, thanks for sending us that update. From a madam to a school teacher, that's a big difference, and I appreciate your sincere apology. We knew you had more information than you let on, but we understand that you were supporting your wife at the time. So you know all these people along here. Oh, yeah. I traveled to season. I've been taking you behind the badge and introducing you to extraordinary police officers across the country. Recently, I traveled to the Big Apple to meet two outstanding NYPD officers, Detective Trotman and his partner, Officer Edwin Rodriguez, who are both making a huge difference in their community. We couldn't walk more than 20 feet without a member of their community sharing stories about how special these two men truly are. Thank you guys for taking time to talk to us today. I know the good work you guys are doing. I want people to know it. Now I'm going to get PTSD getting in the back of this police car. <laughs> you, need, you need a little help getting out? I, I know, this is not my first time. OK. All right, here we go. The NYPD's neighborhood policing program is aimed at getting officers to know the neighborhood and its residents. One year that you've been doing the program, Yes, that's correct. That's great. Yeah, we were lucky. We, we were the first, one of the pilot precincts. There were four precincts that they started the program in. Now it's branched out to, I think, over 20. It's going to be 30-something by next year. They have a phone number, an email address. Anytime they see a problem, they call us immediately. We have that relationship now. So they can call your cell phone and say, hey, something's looking fishy on the street out here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they do. So where are we now? This is St. Nicholas Avenue. It's one of the business groups, and this is 181st Street. You have over 200,000 people walking by any given weekend over. So what do you contend with most here in keeping these people safe? We got some robberies over here because there's a high volume of people and, and some uh, pickpockets. We try to keep uh, you know our presence out there. How you doing? Hey guys, how you doing? Hey. Oh, so hey, come with us, you know. So you know all these people along here. Oh yeah, we see we see them every day. A lot of hard working people. Hey mom, how you feel? Fine. Let's go say hello, Dr. Paul. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm here with these police officers because they're taking good care of you guys, and I just wanted to see what they're doing. Together, we make it better. Yes, that's, that's why cool. I'm talking to you. That's right. That's why I'm talking to you. God bless. God. It's amazing to me that all of these people talk to you. Yeah, no, they're very receptive. It's beautiful. Yeah. As I, mean, I say, this is my home. When the program first started, we started going to community meetings. We didn't realize how big a disconnect it was, because some people would say hello to a student here and there. But one of the people at the community meeting asked us, so it's OK to say hello to police? And when she said that, we could not believe that in some people's lives it's such a big disconnect. If something happens high profile in the country that's negative, does it affect the attitude people have 
with you guys for a while? Oh, we, we see it, but we don't let it affect us because, you know, we, we have a job to do. Every once in a while, we, we get some people shouting things out, and we understand that. You know, we see, we see the media, too. We see what goes on there, and, it, and it, it looks scary a lot of times. There's checks and balances, and people protesting and people letting us know, you know, it gives, it gives us an ear to what's going on. Hi. Hi, I'm Jennifer Garraway. Jennifer, Dr. Phil, how are you doing? Ebenezer Smith. Good to meet you, Ebenezer. So tell me about these guys. The last five years, we've been seeing a lot of drug activity in our building, and I was assigned to these two officers. Yeah. I started organizing tenant meetings, and they came to the first meeting, and they haven't stopped. Now there's no drugs. Put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into yeah. the building. You know. With this program, we build the bridge between the 34 prison and the community because I can easily refer to them. Or I can call them directly. They've made an amazing difference. I mean, I don't know any officer who will give you permission to put their cell phone numbers on, a, on flyers. It really made a difference. Dr. Phil, how are you? Good. Nice What's your you. name? Angelina Ramirez. So what difference do they make around here? The wonderful thing about Rodriguez and Trotman, they have just wonderful faces where people trust them. They're not intimidating. They get the job done, but people respect them. So it's not just like we call them when there's a crime. We actually call them when there are issues with quality of life. There are millions of people watching this right now. What do you want to know about police officers and their relationship with the communities? We became police officers to help people. That's, that's the number one driving force. We really want to make a difference and that now there's a program that lets us do that better than ever. First and foremost, I want to know that we're here for them. You know, give us a chance. Give us a chance to meet us, uh, me and Tommy, one-on-one, -on -one, develop a relationship, and uh, we can uh, change the perspective of the public and see how they, they, they look at police. If you want to nominate an officer or a police department for a Behind the Badge segment, please go to drphil.com and share your story. He accused his girlfriend of stealing over a half a million dollars, and his 81-year-old mom was also the target. He kicked his girlfriend out, but you will not believe where she's calling home now. We are still getting emails asking about Megan, a girlfriend who was accused of stealing nearly a half a million dollars from her boyfriend, Steve. Megan was also accused of forging power of attorney over Steve's 81-year-old mom, taking nearly $200,000 from her as well. Megan admitted she took the money, but didn't like the word steal. You'll remember her. I use the word take rather than stole because I believe that when you steal something, you don't ever intend on giving it back to the person. I have proof that Megan has stolen money for shopping, gas money, Starbucks. I've used Steve's credit cards without telling him. She conned your 81-year-old mother out of $167,000. Right. What's wrong with you? If I knew, I would fix it. I don't know. She loves money, but we don't know where all this money goes. You do know where it went. No, we don't. You say that like you are irritated with him. No, I'm... What about the money? When's it coming back if it's coming back? It's not coming back. Kiss right. it goodbye. You know, everyone right. will see it again. If she doesn't change what she's doing, she's going to go to prison. She needs help. There's something wrong with your moral compass. We were raised to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? I mean, that's how I was raised. Right. Well, she said ben she has nowhere to go. That is not your problem. Well, you've got to put down boundaries. Well, Steve, <laughs> I, I, I just have to tell you, I and everybody else here are absolutely on the edge of our seats. Uh -uh. What's happened? What did you do? Kicked her to the curb. You kicked her to the curb. All right. I just told Megan, I said, get a job and get out of here. And this is what you got to do. So she got a job and got out. And we Put her on a plane, I haven't seen her since. Steve kicked Megan to the curb, but did he ever get his money back? And where is Megan now? Well, Megan is behind bars. The Carson City woman will spend up to 10 years in prison after a basketball ticket scheme. 39-year-old Megan Klein was sentenced to between two and a half and 10 years after pleading guilty to identity theft. Megan was an accomplice in defrauding two people into purchasing bogus shares of NBA teams and season tickets for a total of $350,000. And Steve, 
Well, he says he still talks to Megan behind bars, but only to ensure he gets every penny he says she took from him. I knew I needed to lose a few pounds, but seeing myself on the show was a real wake-up call. Dr. Phil told us about his 2020 diet book. I told Dr. Phil that I already owned his book, and he told me to stop using it as a paperweight. Mel is a former guest who called off her wedding because she did not want to sign a prenuptial agreement that her fiance, Ian, presented just weeks before they were supposed to walk down the aisle. This is what happened when she last appeared on the show. What was supposed to be the best day of our lives, getting married, turned into a total nightmare. Five weeks before the wedding, my fiance, Ian, said that he wanted a prenup signed or he wouldn't marry me. I want the prenup to protect the house that dad gave me. I was so mad at Ian's dad. I said, you're letting money cloud your judgment and it doesn't matter what we have when we're 10 feet under. That was the last time Barry and I spoke. I understand that you took advice from your father, but you're not marrying your father. No. You're marrying her. I have to tell you, this prenup is not your problem. You have trust issues with her. You think she's got a party lifestyle. Yes. And uh -huh. sometimes you don't come home. That is true. I do drink. When Melissa drinks, she can drink to excess. Melissa fell down a flight of stairs. She split her hand wide open with a beer bottle. Her drinking concerns me because I don't know where it's going to end up. I want a prenuptial agreement just in case Melissa does something irresponsible. I would like to set up premarital counseling. Okay. okay. And then put this marriage back on the calendar. And I think you can have a prenuptial agreement in a very limited fashion here. I also want to arrange a trainer and a nutritionist yeah. so you can get yourself really in good shape and feel good about who you are. Thanks, Dr. Fred. I'm going to give you a copy of my book, 2020 Diet. Book. Well, it's not a paperweight. <laughs> you need to read it. Fair enough? Thanks. Fair enough. Well, Mel apparently took what I said about her health to heart. Uh, all I can do is provide the tools, but she had to run with it, and she did. It's five months later, and a lot has changed. Take a look. While I was on the show, Dr. Phil definitely gave us some amazing resources. Dr. Phil suggested that Ian and I work with a marriage counselor. We have learned that communication is key and that my drinking was immature. He also encouraged Ian and I to get our health back. I knew I needed to lose a few pounds, but seeing myself on the show was a real wake-up call. Dr. Phil told us about his 2020 diet book. I told Dr. Phil that I already owned his book, and he told me to stop using it as a paperweight. It's not a paperweight. You need to read it. I took Dr. Phil's advice. I've lost 47 pounds in 17 weeks. We used to eat a lot of processed, easy-to-make food. I have cut all of that out. I've cut out the alcohol drinking binges. Instead of focusing on Thirsty Thursdays, I've replaced it with going to the gym. Dr. Phil gave both of us sessions with Doctor On Demand, and we've been working with an online doctor. My trainer, Robert Reams, is amazing. You got the 48 pounds off right now. The next level for you, another 25. I have a goal to lose another 35 pounds in the next few months. Ian and I are still working on our relationship issues. At the moment, we haven't set a new wedding date. I can tell you firsthand that the 2020 diet really works. If I can do it, anyone can do it. And the best part is I feel amazing. Dr. Phil, I just want to say thank you so much. It's changed my whole lifestyle. In the words of Dr. Dr. Phil, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So you do get a sense of it. Here are some before and after pictures of Mel who lost 48 pounds in 17 weeks. Take a look at this. Wow, good work. Good work. <laughs> Mel was helped along the way by my longtime very good friend, physical trainer and nutritionist Robert Reams. So Robert, how did she do? Oh, she did fantastic. She set a definitive goal and she got the right resources, of course, with us and she went to it and she nailed it. And you don't have to be a great athlete to do this, Not right? Not at all. And the training app that I use, the Pair, the Pair Mobile training app, the workouts adjust to everybody's fitness level. So you can be a beginner, you can be intermediate, and you can be elite. And these workouts adjust to the user's fitness level. So Mel actually started out, you know, she was towards the beginning stage, but she is clearly rocking it right now by just sticking with it. Yeah, that's just great. 
Well, look, I'd like to thank all of my guests and a special thanks to my good friend, personal trainer and nutritionist, Robert Reams, for helping Mel lose an amazing 47 pounds in just over four months. You can go to drphil.com for more information about the Pair Sports Training app. And please go and get your copy of 2020 Diet Today at bookstores and online anywhere. And everybody in the audience is going home with your own copy of the 2020 Diet. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. my patience ran away and my hope keeps me away I am, I am waiting for the day for a miracle let a miracle Anybody in there? All I'm breathing in is in there. I don't feel my body in there. Is there anybody in there? Is there anybody in there? Wanna get all girls up in there? I don't feel nobody in there. Is there anybody in there? Is there anybody?